Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, obviously, standing in these uh, very formidable shoes of Greg's uh, to to do the lecture tonight, I will uh, be channeling you a lot, especially your endless wisdom, Greg. Um, but also, given Father's Day just passed, uh, I was realizing I will do a lot of channeling of my father, who uh, Greg would have loved. They would have gotten on famously. Um, when I first, uh, about 25 years ago, uh, started studying uh, Buddhism, uh, my father thought that the best approach would be to uh, read, I don't know, 30 books on Buddhism as a way to just have a dialogue with me about this practice I was stumbling into. So that was the kind of guy he was. Um, so I will draw from his uh, encyclopedic wisdom today. Um, also was realizing as I was going to be up here talking that I was sort of hoping Wendy would be here. But Wendy is traveling up north uh, to find her daughter, I was told. If you've not met Wendy, uh, Wendy is the person who holds the truth in this place, I feel. So I just call her wherever she is to call something out um, or to keep me honest uh, as we talk tonight. So the Bardo told all, we can do this in an hour, right? You know, it's only about 500 pages long. Um, my hope tonight is actually to, uh, as we were talking about doing this talk, and initially was going to just be exploring Tibetan Buddhism, and uh, the suggestion was to try to pull uh, some texts into this conversation so that uh, we would have a focal point. And so I've pulled some texts, not just the Bardo told all, but two others that we'll talk about, as we sort of look at this journey and experience of Bardo and exploring what that means. So we'll talk for a time and uh, see how it goes. So we're using this particular translation of the Bardo Taldo. If you notice, it's called the Tibetan Book of the Dead. This is probably what it's most, or how it's most well known, uh, as opposed to liberation through hearing in the intermediate states, which is what Bardo Taldo is translated to. And uh, most of you might be familiar with the uh, Evans Wentz uh, translation that came out in the 20s. It actually was only a partial translation of that text. This is the first English, full English translation of the Bardo Toldo that talks about much more than just death and dying. But, you know, I guess one could say that the death and dying sequences in this book are the, the coolest, you know, and there's all sorts of things going on and all sorts of practices and it's kind of hip and sexy and who wants to talk about the Bardo of life and all these other things. But, the great thing about this full text is it really explores what this um, work is striving for us to explore. And so we'll talk a little bit about some of the other components that are represented in this, uh, as well as these two other texts that we're going to explore very briefly that kind of get interwoven in this process. The first is more a ritual, the ritual of Sukhavati. This is usually done at the time of death, um, often at three days after someone has died, and then 49 days after. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. And then also uh, a book, Dzogchen, um, uh, almost tone poem to emptiness and to awakening by Langchun Rebjam, the precious tragedy, prejud ah, ooh, tongue stopped, the precious treasury of the basic space of phenomena. And this was a text that was encouraged uh, when the, one of the first um, patients that I had when I worked as a, as a chaplain in hospice was a very accomplished and very renowned uh, Tibetan Buddhist master who had only recently come over to the US, had lived in India for a long time after escaping from Tibet. And he said, when I die, you must read this with my body. And we did every day, over and over. So I was thinking about how I might approach this conversation, and I realized that it might help to 
set ground rules, for lack of a better expression, or at least a way for us to set our minds so that we can begin to explore these texts. And you'll see what I mean in a second by why I would want to do this. But it's important, I think, for us to have a context of how these texts are used and in, in a way sort of how they evolved and how they can benefit us to deal with transition. For the most part, I, a lot of people who have read the Tibetan Book of the Dead or leafed through it kind of look at it almost maybe as a curiosity or maybe they're interested in learning about it. Often it is looked at as a scholarly text, but all of the texts that we're talking about tonight are actual practice materials. These are texts that are used throughout a person's life as well, especially during death. So if I, especially if I was Tibetan, I would have a monk come and for 49 days would come to my house and read from the Bardo Toldal. So for me, just uh, in my work as a chaplain uh, for about 20 years, uh, I always strived for finding the practical in the work that I was doing. Because if you're sitting with someone who's dying, uh, there's a way in which they generally need very practical things to work with. They need things that they can relate to and look at and kind of chew on. So the problem if I were to become too esoteric or too kind of uh, talking about concepts or too in my head, usually that lasted about five minutes that they really wanted to talk to me. And so what I found over years and years was really pulling at these threads of the practical and of the practice. How does this living document, all of these things are living documents, they, they breathe, they have a guide for us. And so how do I pull at that to help me on this path, to help inform not only my own awakening and my own understanding, but how can I be a witness to someone else's experience? and maybe offer a, a listening ear or a witness. And the second piece to consider, or to sort of as a, as a ground that we might be standing on as we're exploring these texts, is this notion that the phenomenal world is much more than we sort of think it is. And it kind of pulls at this notion of a kind of core bewilderment that uh, the, the Buddhist tradition really explores and looks at in terms of our daily life. That we live often in this experience of duality. There is myself and there's the entire world that I am interacting with. But there is this fundamental duality. And in that duality becomes uh, bewilderment and confusion and suffering. And so part of these texts are really to kind of pull at our understanding of ourself, our understanding of what we really think the world is about. And I just, it's sort of, um, I, I, these are the moments where I wish I could like have someone, you know, sort of go into my brain and experience some of the things that I've seen and witnessed in my life. And this is working with thousands of people who have, or who are ill, who are dying, who have died, whose bodies I am tending, whose bodies I might be cremating, which I've helped do. Um, all the way to doing different rituals and things in Africa and in, in India and in Nepal, in which what we think of as um, the phenomenal world is so much richer and so much more flexible than we give it credit. And part of what these texts are talking about and exploring is are we willing to look at our phenomenal world in a different way? Are we willing to actually sort of pull apart that notion of ourself, that solid aspect that we think we are moving through space and time? Um, I don't know if you've, um, if you've ever watched the movie uh, Lucy. Is that a movie that's familiar? The Matrix? Have you seen The Matrix? Okay, everyone's seen The Matrix probably. Um, well, there's this wonderful movie 
somewhat violent, but uh, interesting in terms of looking at this notion of consciousness. Uh, it's a movie called Lucy, uh, um, Scarlett Johansson is in it. And basically this main character for various reasons ingests this uh, drug that is a, that opens up her consciousness. And in the th course of the film, she goes from kind of stuck, dual, bewildered, confused being to enlightened. And there's a point in which uh, she's sitting in a car and her elevated consciousness has come to a point where she's looking out the window of this car and she looks at a tree and no longer sees the tree as a solid object, but sees it as this pulsing, coursing energy that's flowing in and out of the tree and the glow that's happening from its aura. And she begins to see all of the things around her actually like a lit with a new energy and pulse that she hadn't realized was there. And we might say, oh, that's kind of an interesting conceit in a movie. But I have sat with meditation masters who see the world in that way. They see the pulse and the breath of things that we think have no life to them. So that's kind of the, the piece that's being pulled at here. And I'm encouraging for us to sort of hold in our mind. And then that is core to all of this is this notion of change and transition, that we are actually impermanent. Not only are we impermanent, but everything around us is impermanent. And there is a lot of change that happens around us all the time that we don't even notice because it's happening on such a microscopic level. But sometimes if you've had experiences in your life that are more profound change or something that has sort of rocked your awareness, um, then that is actually a place to, to begin to understand what that impermanence is about. I remember um, I was uh, 26, this was maybe about three months before my mother died, and um, I was actually traveling to where she was uh, staying with my dad in Maine, and I had not seen her actually for several months. Um, and in the, between the time that I had seen her last, um, one of her vertebrae had collapsed because of the cancer that was eating away her spine um, so that uh, she had to have surgery and had to have more chemo and radiation. And so I had, this was my first time seeing her in months. But the last time I had seen her, she was strong and uh, healthy and doing activities and going out and working and, and had kind of all of her life was kind of moving forward. And when I arrived in Maine, um, I was greeted by my father who looked uh, clearly out of sorts, and I didn't understand why. And I, he's, I said, I want to go say hi to mom. He says, oh, she's in the bedroom. And so I walked back to uh, where their room was. And when you walked into this room, um, you walked in, the bed was here, and then the bathroom was off to the left. And so as I was approaching the room, the door to the bedroom was open. And uh, as I got closer, she came out of the bathroom. And the only thing I can say is that it was looking at someone who was a hundred years old. She was pale, walking with a walker, barely able to stand up. She was not the person I remember. And there was this experience of, uh, um, I don't like I don't I don't know how to process this. And so we have these experiences of change and impermanence that are essential for us, essential for our awakening to understand that there is something very core going on. These texts are used for the time of death, but they are also for our life and for practicing and stepping into this experience of transition so that we become accustomed to it, so that we actually build a friendship with transition, with change, with awakening. I love this photo. <laughs> to me, it's like, that is so bardo. That's like, oh. um, um, So uh, I would say if, if you were, if someone actually, if you ask someone on the street to define the word bardo, they might say Lincoln and bardo, you know, that cool book that just came out. Um, uh, but more often than not, bardo is sort of associated with 
this period of time from death to rebirth. And although that is a bardo, it is not the definition of bardo. And actually, bardo itself is a term that is used for uh, a little bit more of a broader experience. But it literally translates as intermediate state. Intermediate coming between two things and time, place, character, etc. A space between one moment and the next. So one could say that we've had multiple Bordeaux since we've been hanging out here. Um, and in the uh, traditional Buddhist tradition, and uh, uh, certainly in the Tibetan tradition, uh, bardo is used to define these small moments of gap in between experience, but also a larger, sort of like small b bardo, like we've had multiple bardos since we've been hanging out here, but then larger states of this sort of space in between. Uh, there are six usually talked of. Um, we're going to look at five of them today. Um, and so one of the um, expressions that I really love um, by this gentleman, um, uh, Kempo Karthar Rinpoche, is um, this notion of interval of possibility. Um, this notion that uh, there is, yes, there is change. Yes, there is suffering. Yes, there is a struggle. But also, there is this opportunity for something, this possibility for uh, awakening, for understanding, for a shift to happen. And so if we look at the, the five kind of traditional bardo states, it's the bardo of living, the bardo of dream, and the bardo of death. The bardo of death usually has dying, being dead, and rebirth as smaller sort of experiences, if you will, within that concept of death and dying. And one could also say that the bardo of dream is also in the bardo of living as well. Um, but these are classic uh, delineations made within the Bardo Toldal of our experience. It's also Bardo of meditation, but we're not going to talk about that particularly today. <coughs> but before we do, there again is kind of coming back to this notion of bewilderment um, and this notion that we are in this state of confusion because of this kind of core relationship that we have in the world and our, how we see the world and how we interact with it. But as Kempo will say, the bardo is not just the period between lives. In fact, the bardo taught that as long as there is a state of bewilderment, all of samsara and nirvana without exception can be included in or summarized as the bardo. As long as there is fixation on duality, as long as you believe in the independent existence of what you experience and the cognition that experiences it, you are in some kind of bardo or interval. As long as all the different categories of twos arise for you, pleasure and pain, good and bad, samsara and nirvana, you are in the bardo. We conclude with the aspiration, may I gain trust in the Buddha's teachings, that all of samsara and nirvana are in this way included in this category of bardo, which does not truly exist, but never, nevertheless appears to. Good, bad, happy, and sad, all are like the imprint of a bird on the sky, always shifting, always changing. And so there's a way in which this experience of death and dying actually works away at that duality. And just having sat again with a lot of people who are dying, there's a way in which their own sense of self is starting to dissolve and um, break apart. Sometimes it's becoming more solid uh, as they kind of hold on to that, what I feel is my, my ego or my personality. But it, even as they're doing that, it's dissolving and falling apart. And so one of the things that these texts are really asking us to do is to step into that experience, to step into the fire of that uh, reality, as opposed to avoid it. Um, so the, the Bardo Toldal, um, which we 
will sort of this. There's a way I think tonight that um, this will kind of be the the text that we'll sort of walk through the bardos with, um, and then as we go, these other texts sort of come up as uh, ritual texts, if you will, or ways that things that can be offered in this process of transition. Um, this particular um, text is actually one of only. <laughs> this is what I love about the Tibetan tradition, is, is this is actually only a part <laughs> of some other massive collection. Um, uh, I've always admired the Tibetans for if you have a subject, we will write volumes and volumes and volumes and, and get into as much detail as possible because there's something in that and that process of pulling those things apart that we see how much space there actually is in things. Um, welcome. Um, this particular text uh, was first uh, translated in the 8th century, uh, at least translated into Tibetan. Um, and it's, although it existed as a text in India and was a practice text part of uh, the Guru Garba Tantra, um, there's a way in which when it came to Tibet and was sort of embraced by the tradition of Buddhism in Tibet, that it kind of took on a whole other life and really became utilized as a text of practice, a text that was used to help guide a person who might be wandering in the bardo, uh, both in their lives, but also at the moment of death and afterwards. It is and this is kind of earlier when I was talking about sort of holding a, uh, that the phenomenal world is maybe a little, you know, a little uh, more uh, uh, open than maybe we think it is. Um, Padmasambhava is considered to be uh, the, the, the person who brought this text uh, to, uh, to the world and had it translated. Um, are you, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Padmasambhava. Is that a familiar person? Uh, Guru Rinpoche is also a name. Um, I see one hand, <laughs> a couple hands. Um, Padmasambhava was an Indian Siddha, incredible, uh, accomplished practitioner who very much embodied crazy wisdom and this kind of the if you the notion of the guru who could um, wrangle space and time to transform the world. It would have been him, and he is credited with, in a in a sense, bringing. Buddhism to Tibet and taming the actual land of Tibet so that the teachings could take hold. Um, uh, and in that process, he, there was a point in uh, when this was translated uh, in the 8th century, uh, Padmasambhava was, was teaching this particular text. And he felt that because of the, the ability for people to perhaps understand or to fully um, um, relate to this text in a proper way, uh, he felt that it was actually better to hide the text, to, um, to put it away for a future generation that could possibly understand it maybe a little bit differently or to have the bandwidth with really to understand its purpose. This is something that's not just common in Tibet but also in early China and in India in which great masters take a text and hide it in the earth, in rock, in a tree, in solid matter. Um, In Tibet, there is what's called a turtan. This is someone who is a treasure finder. And uh, I've talked with people who have been traveling with people like this, who will be walking along and stop and go, there, there's something here. And will walk over to a boulder and put their hand into a solid boulder and pull out a text or pull out an item of a ritual object. Now, I. I leave it to you to, <laughs> to decide how you feel about that. Um, but this is something that in the Tibetan tradition is uh, documented and talked about and part of the ritual of discovering these texts. And so it was uh, in the um, uh, 14th century that 
uh, a gentleman named Yeshe Sogyal, uh, not Yeshe Sogyal, sorry, um, um, Karma Lingpa in the 14th century uh, discovered this text um, and then printed it and taught it and it became a standard text that is still used, as I said today, uh, by monks and monastics um, to help people as they are transitioning in the bardo. Um, again, that sort of encouragement to hold that these things potentially could be true, even though they might seem impossible. So the bardo of life. And as I mentioned, the bardo of life is what we're in at the moment. And in fact, if we wanted to, this is actually an incredible time and opportunity to practice. Um, however that means for you. So just because I'm a Buddhist practitioner and that's something that calls to me, there are people who um, might follow a different tradition and likely follow a different tradition who could step into that practice to learn about compassion and kindness and learn about their own mind and find a different way of being in the world. So it's again this opportunity. But that this bardo of life is very much, as we've talked about, marked by change and transition and uh, impermanence. That there is this sense that we, if you think about this, so how often have you woken up and like had just, you've just woken up on the wrong side of the bed, as they would say, and so your whole morning is sort of marked with feeling in a bad mood and you're kind of like, everything, everything in a sense that you're experiencing is seen through this mirror, through this um, veil, if you will, of, of, of that mood. But then in the afternoon, you're feeling better and things are great and actually the meeting that you were really worried about went better than you thought and suddenly you're in a totally different state of mind. So what was that first state of mind? An illusion? Temporary? And that's sort of what the practice is encouraging us to look at. This sort of fickle nature of our mind that is constantly changing, that is, in a, in a sense, also affected by our outwardly and inwardly process. Um, but there's this really almost as if we're being carried by this river back and forth, um, not moving with it, but almost kind of struggling against it. This, the fluctuations and uh, movement of the bardo. And so traditionally in the bardo Taldal and other texts, what we're encouraged to do is meditate, pay attention to how we are in the world. Do we bring compassion and kindness uh, patience, generosity into our lives and into how we interact with our life? Or are we about what I need and what I can get for myself? Um, and this is not unique to Buddhism, um, but I, I, I feel and I've felt just uh, 20 plus years of relating to this practice that um, it's, there's a way in which every day I have to find a practical application I have to find a way to uh, engage people in a different way and also engage myself in a different way, to engage my fears and my anxiety and my apprehensions, my feelings of self-worth or lack of self-worth, that I could be a good human being, that I could help another person, that I could also be kind to myself. But we learn to rest in this notion of this illusion of phenomena, that things are constantly changing, that what I think is true may not be so true. And what is then true, ultimately? <coughs> I, um, when I was, uh, as I mentioned, my mother died uh, when I was 26, but she was sick uh, when I was 16. And I remember, uh, Christmas break, uh, my f sophomore year of high school, and uh, I was at boarding school, so I came back and like, oh, it's Christmas, you know, we're going to have presents and it's going to be hanging out. And uh, we spent most of that Christmas break in the hospital while my mother got a mastectomy um, as she was just experiencing that start of her illness and that journey that she went on for 10 years with her illness. And I still remember this moment of being... 16 and wait, this, 
is, is this how I, this is Christmas, right? Like we're supposed this this is this is not how you're supposed to spend Christmas, um, and just kind of pushing against this experience of this seems. Like, this is not how it's supposed to be. This is not how this path is supposed to, this experience is supposed to be different. Um, and it sort of planted a seed of, oh, I guess that thing of, oh, my parents might be, I'm, I'm going to go to school, and then I'm going to have a job, and I'll have children, and then my parents will be there to help, and they'll be grandparents, and all of this. That may not actually play out. I don't know how long she's going to live. Um, huh. Okay, so what does that mean? And I'm still trying to figure that out. But this is where this sort of opening can begin to happen. And we can begin to sort of uh, sift through our experiences in a different way. And so the bardo of dream. Uh, uh, and just to one other thing that even in all of that, that there is this, again, possibility there is an ability for us to do something in that space. The bardo of dream also kind of is struggling with a core bewilderment in the sense that if you've ever had one of those dreams that feels like so you wake up and you're like, wow, I was in a movie and I was like running like, you know, and I was fighting aliens and you know, whatever happened. I, I don't know. Do you fight aliens? Anyone fight aliens in their dreams? Um, I always kind of want that. I know mine are really like, I ate a sandwich, you know, like, uh, uh, like um, my wife keeps telling me like amazing story. Like yeah, I was doing this and I was flying and then I was writing down and I'm like, what? I need a better dream. Uh, I need to get a dream. A, do, a dream docent would be great, right? So like, your dreams tonight are going to be amazing. Um, but there is this kind of essential piece where I think I, in that dream, I feel like that dream, it, the, that experience is completely real. And yet, it is not. It's illusionary. But then when we awake, we then are processing and looking at the dream, and that also is not really holding that experience either. It is interpreting it and looking at it and actually also not experiencing it. And so there's this aspect of kind of dual bewilderment that occurs. Um, however, again, this, in fact, if uh, you're familiar at all with dream yoga or uh, lucid dreaming, okay, um, these are practices that were developed um, and have been around for millennia that are a way for us to step into that dream experience. So that as I fall asleep, I'd say, as I dream, I will be aware that I'm dreaming. Because think of what you could do. If you were aware in that experience, you could sit and meditate the entire time, or you could go on a journey, or you could uh, practice kindness in that dream. There's so many possibilities that could actually then help practice other things than just sort of being again, flung around like a rag doll. Um, I just had to put this in here because this is amazing. <laughs> I want to be this, I want to be the friend of this monkey. Um, and so this can actually be an incredible opportunity if we are willing to step into it. And actually there are a number of books, um, uh, uh, the six, um, I think it's the Six Yogas of Naropa uh, has a whole teaching on dream yoga. So uh, maybe we need to also talk to the, the you in the pink. You will be our dream yoga expert. Um, and so then we are in this bardo of death. And as I had mentioned, there are three bardos, or sort of three steps within this bardo of death, of the bardo of dying, the bardo of being dead, sometimes referred to as the bardo of dharmata, and the bardo of rebirth. When I've kind of talked about these things before, usually you say the bardo of dharmata, and like it's like, Whoo, like huh? what is that? What's the dharma what? Um, and so I really have, I've appreciated in this particular book uh, by Kempo Carther that it's sort of, that's the bardo of your debt. Like there's a whole other experience that is happening. So there is this moment from I have lived my life and then there is a moment in which this life is ending 
and then a journey from that point uh, to when I am returning, maybe as a human or maybe as a different kind of creature. In general, in Buddhism, there's a belief in reincarnation and coming back again and again and again. However, there's by, by embracing this notion that things are transitory, that there is actual emptiness and luminosity and all of these things that could potentially help us shift so that we're not coming back just as a automaton over and over again, but that we could, in effect, choose how we come back, that we could choose to come back over and over again for the benefit of other beings. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about um, these pieces. And as we do explore um, the aspects in the Bardo Toldo, um, this is, again, now we're kind of entering the territory that a lot of people are familiar with in terms of this talking about how the body dies, that experience of the transition from the last moment of life to returning, and then that process of returning. Uh, Raja uh, Horstein um, is a wonderful photographer. Uh, for a number of years, I worked with Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco, um, uh, helping uh, run the program there. And uh, he did these incredible photos of uh, patients who uh, were uh, being taken care of in the guest house, which ran, and I think it just closed, but for about 30 plus years was a refuge where people could come and die and be witnessed and supported as they were and as they are. Um, actually, all, all of these photos were used um, to train volunteers to begin to step into the experience of what it means to sit with someone who is ill, to sit with someone who is dying. So, I think this is a point where um, I kind of mentioned this before, but the the moment of dying is really not the best time to start learning all of this. Uh, sort of why this, and sort of I think what's great about this particular translation of the Bardo Taldal is that there's a fairly decent portion of this book that is talking about what to do while you're still alive. Because that uh, bardo of life and living is potentially much longer. Maybe it's only a few moments. I've, you know, I've held babies in my hands while, they, while it died, as well as 100-year-old people who uh, had been on this earth for a long time. But there's a basic notion that we have a longer period of time, and also more facility and ability to kind of step into this experience. But generally, the moment when you're really sick and dying is, is a much harder time to start working and looking and exploring these things. Even though you are dying and you pretty much can't get away from that experience. It is probably one of the most direct experiences that I've just seen people struggle with because it is uncompromising. When your body is shutting down, there is no negotiation. It is happening and it is an experience that we're going through. Um, but I've also seen where someone has asked me a month before they die, oh, oh I hear you're a Buddhist a practitioner, can you teach me meditation? And I would certainly be open to, to trying to do that. Um, but a number, I would say maybe 90% of the time, that, that was not the time to learn it. Um, and usually the meditation instruction lasted about two minutes before they fell asleep or were in such pain or distracted from something else. And so it's, again, something that is being encouraged before we even get to this point. However, in this text and in these approaches, there's still room for awakening. There's still room to, to work with that experience. Traditionally, um, there is talking about how the elements uh, dissolve in the body, not necessarily in a, it, it's presented in a particular order, but these can sometimes go out of order. But it's talked that the first element that dissolves is the earth element. 
And so you see, and I've seen this, uh, where a, a person begins to feel heavy, that there's sort of a weight on them. There's an dis- inability to get out of bed, to, to move, to, to be able to even engage must in, in everyday life. And so that is the earth element that is slowly dissolving. And this dissolves into the water element, and then the water element dissolves. So you see um, a person, their, the, their eyes are, get dried out, their, um, their, more, their, their, their mouth is dry. Even if they take water, they don't not really interested in water, and most likely it, it's almost like not of interest anymore. And from that then, the fire element dissolves, they feel colder, you can actually, uh, and not always, but um, there's often times where, in a sense, the um, the heat, the the fire element is sort of coming closer to the center of their body. So their hands, a person's hands will get colder, their feet will get colder, it'll get more mottled. Um, you'll see that there's sort of that energy pulling in towards the center. And then finally, the wind element, the breath element dissolves. And here it's actually talked about, you know, the, you might see the breath stop externally. Um, so what is kind of fascinating and amazing about this uh, process that's explored in this particular text is that a person's, a person's stopping breathing is not necessarily when they die. <laughs> like yeah, there's one thing that's stopping, but there's a whole other process and thing that is happening on a more consciousness level. Um, and I've, I've, uh, when my uh, my father was dying, um, there would be just sort of sitting in the room with him, in which he would take a breath about every minute, um, and just that gap, that space, of a. that pause. That's a bardo. This is opportunity to sit in that space and breathe as he's breathing. And so these dissolve. And traditionally, in the, in the teachings, um, there are then three stages that dissolve from this point of the elements dissolving and kind of coming into the center. And the first, and it's not a missing slide, (laughs) um, is the disillusion of appearances. And it is said in the text that the person experiences this incredible white, bright light. and I've certainly seen this, and Kempo Kreffa talks about this in his book of, of uh, remembers a, a practitioner, a, st- a student of his who was dying, who was like, wow, why are all the lights, why are so many lights on right now? But there weren't any. Um, and so this incredible experience of brightness. And it is said that this is actually a time in which um, if we're looking at uh, the core aspects of passion, aggression, and ignorance, which is often talked about as kind of the three things that drive a lot of our actions, that it is in this state as it is dissolving that anger and aggression um, is, is sort of, it doesn't disappear, but it is muted. It is kind of pushed and dissolved down to a, um, um, so that it's not really a factor anymore. Some of the texts uh, and the Bardo Toldo talks of this as a, this experience of a smoke uh, filling the room. And from here, there is then the dissolution of what is called increase. And in the text, it talks of the person being overwhelmed or having this experience of a red. Uh, uh, some, sometimes a flashing of red or sometimes a full vision experience of this redness. And it is said that here is the dissolution of passion. So if we have passion, aggression, passion, ignorance, it is here that 
that the drive of, of desires and passions becomes subsumed and quieted. It also can be a moment when hallucinations occur, both positive and negative. It is said that, in a sense, our actions in this life uh, become mirrored in those hallucinations. So if we have spent our lives uh, creating chaos and harm and discord, our hallucinations will be reverberated in that way. We will be mirrored, it will be mirrored back to us how we were in the world. So if we have attempted to try to bring kindness and compassion and a different kind of experience that that is mirrored and reflected back. It said also too that this is a stage when we, uh, the person is aware that they are dying. And so this is actually an incredible moment to encourage them to practice if they have a practice. And as a Buddhist, uh, as a spiritual counselor, I would say most of the people I worked with were not Buddhist. However, I could still encourage them to draw from the tradition that meant, had meaning for them in that moment. So if they were Christian, they could uh, have someone read from uh, passages from the Bible or what was most meaningful to them in their uh, practice in their lives, uh, if they were Muslim or if they were Jewish. So the, there's a way in which this is just an opportunity to encourage that person to reflect on the things that actually inspired them, that actually brought them joy, brought them excitement, brought them elation in the, in the way of connection. So again, there's this moment where even in this dissolution, there is this opportunity. Um, so in the Tibetan tradition, one would be uh, reading and speaking mantras at this time for this person. They might start reading from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, but usually it's not quite the right time for that yet. It's more encouraging them to connect to if they had a teacher in their life or if there was a, a practice that they did throughout their lives. This is also an opportunity to do a POA practice. I'm not sure how many are familiar with the term POA or POA practice. This is basically, yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to assume you're going to raise your hand every time. Although that gentleman did too. Um, POA practice is the tradition of ejecting one's consciousness out of the top of one's head. If you are Tibetan and you're in your 40s or 50s, you can pretty much be guaranteed that you're going to POA class, which I love. I love the fact that I would go to POA class to learn how to eject my consciousness. Um, I'm not going to spin class today. I have to go eject my consciousness. Um, I just, I love that that is what's the time to work on these things, is when you have the ability to visualize and to imagine that so that in this moment, when you are out of control, when you have potentially no longer control over your physical body, that that is a moment when you can release the consciousness so that it may go and travel as it needs to. And then, and this is also not a mistake, um, there is this third stage, and that is the dissolution of attainment. And it's described as complete blackness, darkness. At this point, everything is shutting down your mind, your awareness. There's a metaphor that's used that you are like, um, it's like a butter lamp that is placed within a vase. And if you saw that vase in a room, you wouldn't even know that there was a light within it. But it's there ever so slightly. So our light is almost extinguished. And this can also be when um, the, sense, uh, the senses in, the, um, in traditional uh, uh, Buddhist tradition, um, traditional Buddhist tradition, um, our senses are more than just our eyes, if you will. There is a process that looks at the, the, um, the object that receives that information, like my eardrums or my eyes or my taste buds. But then there's another process that takes that information and makes meaning out of it, if you will. So um, does that make sense? You know, we, we don't, if I see, uh, because I have practiced Buddhism for a long time, I can look at that tanka over there and I see a tanka, but I also have all sorts of meaning and uh, experience that I put on that object. I'm not seeing it just blankly. And so there's a way in which this particular moment 
of this blackness is when the, that sense consciousness dissolves, that we are becoming more and more, if you will, a blank slate. All of these things are dissolving. Our body is dissolving. And so it is here that is talked about an experience of the clear light or Buddha nature arising. Um, so in uh, traditional Eastern medicine, it talks a lot about the channels in the body and how we are, uh, have these energies and channels that are shifting throughout our bodies. But that when we are born, um, we are obviously are from the seed of the mother and seed of the father. And so the red uh, for the mother is usually lays or resides in the navel area and the father seed is up in the crown of the top of the head. And there's a channel of wind, life wind, that is throughout our whole life is keeping those two separated. But at this particular moment in the experience, that wind begins to dissolve. And these two seeds pull together and meet at the heart center. And it is said in these texts um, and described that then there is this experience of our, if you will, Buddha nature, a clear light, cloudless, clear sky, boundless. And we experience it, in fact, all beings experience it from the, what the Bardo it, Total talks about is that all beings have this experience. It doesn't matter if you were a meditator or not. That because we are now without this body, this reference point, that we start to experience the world without a filter. And we see our true nature. So, you know, it is felt that, um, that really at our core, even if we feel like we are struggling and um, I don't make the best decisions in my life and I feel like I could be nicer to people and I, I, I just, I really struggle. You know, there's a sense, at least in terms of uh, Buddhism and this notion of Buddha nature, that at our core, at who we are, what our being is, what our consciousness is, is luminous, sanity, clear without struggle. And so in this moment, as we are dying and we are almost dead, we have that experience of that true nature. And so these texts give tools with which to practice uh, that understanding, that awareness in our lives so that when this is happening, we can actually stay and reside in that openness, in that Buddha nature. And that if we can, and we can acknowledge and see what's going on and stay in that space, that we could attain awakening. We could attain enlightenment in this moment. What often happens is we kind of zip right by this. We experience it and then it's like, oh, okay, that was, that was interesting. And then <laughs> you keep going. Um, but if we're able to reside in that space, then a lot is possible. And now we are dead. Um, again, this is from this series of photographs that was taken at Zen Hospice. Um, uh, they're, they're pretty incredible. Um, It is important to understand that this type of liberation when someone recognizes the ground clear light at the moment of death is complete and full. It is the actual achievement of perfect awakening or Buddhahood at the moment of death. When a person achieves this type of liberation, they achieve Buddhahood with all of the qualities for which it is renowned. Not only their own liberation, but the ensuing and permanent all pervasive ability to be of consummate benefit to others in every possible way until each and every other being has likewise achieved perfect awakening. That is what's possible. Um, so this is often a moment when uh, 
we would do a three-day vigil. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to sit with someone's body after they died. Is that an experience anyone has had here? Oh, okay, cool. Um, it, at least in my, for me, uh, is one of uh, the most profound, important experiences you can ever have. There is something about the directness of sitting still with a person's body, practicing, sitting, breathing, um, that will remind you of how vibrant life can be, um, and, and then what do I, what kind of action do I take from that space? In uh, Buddhism, in the traditional Buddhist tradition, um, uh, not disturbing the body, meditating, offering mantra, uh, bringing in a teacher who might then start reading the Bardo Toldal um, to that person, um, creating an environment that is still and calm. Because it is felt that the first three days and even the, f the 49 days that uh, that consciousness is traveling from this, what first, this life that has died to a life that is arriving, there is still confusion. There is still a thinking that I am connected to this body. That, that this body is alive. And so there are things that you want to do to kind of help remind the person that that's not the case. And so if possible, before the person has died, they're often put in a position often on the right side of their body um, uh, because that is the position that Buddha died. Um, and one would speak directly to the person. You have died. You've taken your last breath. Now is your opportunity to practice. Don't be frightened. It will be okay. O child of Buddha nature, that which is called death has now arrived. You are leaving this world, but in this you are not alone. This happens to everyone. Do not be attached to this life. Do not cling to this life. Even if you remain attached and clinging, you do not have the power to stay. You will only continue to roam within the cycles of existence. Therefore, do not be attached. Do not cling. Think of the three precious jewels. O oh, child of Buddha nature, however terrifying the appearances of the intermediate state of reality might be, do not forget the following words. Go forward remembering their meaning. The crucial point is that through them, recognition may be obtained. And so this will literally be read every day um, uh, at this point. Um, I point out too, uh, if you have a chance, and I'll, we can share this uh, later, uh, this is an incredible documentary, uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, narrated by uh, Leonard Cohen. and. Uh, they actually have permission to follow a monk as he does this ritual. Uh, and it's really pretty amazing. Uh, it's actually two documentaries that about two hours in, in length. And so this is this kind of uh, experience that we're creating. Um, this would also be the time, you might do a Sukhavati at this time, but that usually happens a little bit later. But here is an opportunity uh, for a text like, like this one, The Precious Treasury, The Basic Space of Phenomena. Um, uh, Longchen Rabjam, uh, this is also, I believe, 14th century, and uh, wrote this as a exploration of emptiness, of luminosity. Uh, this is a Dzogchen text, if you're familiar with the word Dzogchen, um, in which this is a practice that is helping us to study and look at emptiness. And so, uh, as I had mentioned, uh, this, Buddhist, um, this Buddhist teacher had asked us to read this uh, at his, while his body was in state, and we sat for three days and read this. Oh, someone was always reading this, either in Tibetan or in English, uh, the entire time while his body uh, was just lying uh, there and we were practicing. 
But I wanted, as part of just showing the, the, these other texts that are present other than the Bardo Toldo, I uh, thought I would just read a short passage from this to get an idea of what you're reading, what's, what this person is experiencing. Um, and I thought space pictures behind me would make sense. Mm -hmm. um, let whatever happens, happen. And whatever manifests, manifest. Let whatever occurs, occur. And whatever is, be. Let whatever is anything at all be nothing at all. With your conduct unpredictable, you make the final leap into awareness. Without the slightest basis for determining what is spiritual or not. And so this bare state with no reference point is beyond the cage of philosophy. Whether eating, moving around, lying down, or sitting day and night, you rest in infinite evenness. Even so that even so that you experience the true nature of phenomena as their equalness. There are no gods to worship, no demons to exercise, nothing to cultivate in meditation. This is the completely ordinary state. With this single state of evenness, the uncontrived ruler that has no pride, there is oneness, a relaxed and unstructured openness. How delightful! Things are timelessly ensured without having to be done, and being free of effort and achievement, you are content. And so that would be read as the person remains. Traditionally in Tibet, after three days, there's kind of two things that might happen. One is the body is uh, taken to a charnel ground, chopped up, and fed to the vultures. <laughs> um, not something we do here, particularly. Um, and uh, I think over the years, especially with uh, the political situation in Tibet, this has become a little bit harder to occur, but it still does occur. Um, I kind of this. I saw that. I found this picture, and I thought this is like a set. I feel like a, this is like Hollywood's version of a charnel ground. Um, that's what happens. Uh, most people would no normally do that because that basically doesn't cost any money. And there's a way in which the body is, uh, after it is cleaned, picked uh, uh, picked clean by vultures. The bones are collected. The bones are burned. The bones are crushed into ash, and then that ash is mixed in with seed, bird seed, and fed back to the vultures. So this cycle of life going back to ash, going back to dust. Um, the other would be cremation. Cremation is actually more expensive. Uh, you sometimes have to spend years and years saving up enough money to buy, to buy the wood in order to burn your body. Um, I've done uh, five open air cremations uh, when I worked in Colorado. And it takes about a cord of wood to burn a body. Um, and so if you think about uh, if you're making only a few cents or dollars a month that that could be that's a lot of money you would have to save to to afford that so it's often at least traditionally in Tibet why many people would just be brought to the charnel ground um, so even after the three days where the body is um, uh, is disposed of in whatever fashion, um, the monk or the, the teacher is still coming back to the house every day to read from the Bardo Toldal. Because now is this journey from uh, for, form, formlessness, and then eventually back to a form again. But now the body is very much gone, and so this is a time when the consciousness can be confused and disoriented and wondering what has happened. So this usually is sort of the period of 49 days is kind of starts around this particular period of time. It's sort of seven series of seven. Um, and each round of those seven, that person is shifting from what they knew and that consciousness experienced as their body. I'm Carlisle and this is who I was. Um, but as that consciousness moves away from that point of death, they become less and less attached and almost, in a sense, lose that interest in that past form. And they're beginning to search for a new form. Um, this is where I would say the most famous part of this particular text, Bardo Toldal, explores um, 
the uh, peaceful and wrathful deities, the experiences that people have in this 49-day arc that is occurring. And I'm not going to talk too much about that because I think I've definitely probably gone longer than 45 minutes. Um, but it is uh, incredibly complex and detailed. And part of it is we might actually look at uh, this is a mandala, by the way, of the hundred uh, peaceful and wrathful deities represented as all in one. Uh, most of these mandalas also are created to actually have the mantra of each one of those. And as that person is experiencing that arc through the 49 days, they are raw. Imagine, if you will, that you don't have a body. Imagine if you were to experience the sun without any block at all, as if you had the full force of the sun and the full force of a cold wind or, the wa or water washing up on you, had no ability to um, have a barrier to that. Well, this arc of 49 days, the consciousness is experiencing all the phenomena in this way. And so it is said that there are uh, periods in which we are interacting with uh, the, a peaceful peaceful deities that are there to inspire us, to, to encourage us to practice. But they're rather intense because they are, well, that's more a raffle um, deity actually on the wall over there. But imagine like seeing that being appear and say hi to you. <laughs> um, you might be like, whoa, that, that's a serious dude or a lady. I can't tell from here. Um, uh, so there's a way in which this experience is very intense and overwhelming. Part of the reason to study this text now and in this experience is so that one becomes accustomed to what these experiences are going to be like so that I could remain in that light. I could remain as the uh, wrathful deities appear that I don't become overwhelmed. That as sounds appear, I don't become completely stunned and frightened at those sounds that I know that those are actually just my mind. So there's a way, I think, too, in uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, this is very much a, a, a Vajrayana Buddhist text. Uh, the Tibetan tradition is a Vajrayana tradition in which uh, we might visualize uh, a deity, uh, say, or a protector. That's, I think, more of a protector. But um, I think in the back is a deity. I don't know, it would just be Buddha. I don't know. Again, my eyes are, um, I can't see you all the way back there, but, um, and so if I'm in practice, I might visualize uh, that in front of me, but actually what I'm visualizing is actually that that's also within me. Like, so that incredible scene and the majestic Buddha sitting there is also myself. And so this is this time in which I am formless. I could sit and meditate these 49 days as a, as a consciousness. This is this opportunity for practice. But towards the end of this 49-day period, there is a searching, a craving, a need to find a return. And so it is talked about that this could also, though, be an opportunity to choose how I return. Um, if you're familiar with the term bodhisattva, is that a term that's familiar? Um, so um, those may not be familiar, bodhisattva is a being who, although becomes enlightened, chooses to come back lifetime after lifetime for the benefit of all beings until all beings are free of suffering. So it is embodiment of altruism, embodiment of um, being of service to others. And so one could, as I am reaching and almost back returning to a new life, I could find and pick a birth that will be auspicious for me to be of benefit to others. I could choose as opposed to come from a place of fear. Um, and so at that point in the Bardo Taldo, there is a reading and talking and um, expressing all of the possibilities of choice and the things that one could do. <clears throat> that you choose rather than your karma choosing. And so this is probably where um, you would have a Sukhavati 
ritual. Uh, this is one of the other texts that I said would be to sort of bring in along with the Bardo Toldo. Um, Sukhavati is connected to Amitabha. Amitabha is Buddha who resides in Sukhavati, which is a pure realm. You may have heard of Pure Land Buddhism. Uh, that is a, a tradition that really focuses on uh, dying and being reborn in this pure realm. And so the Sukhavati is a way, at least in the Tibetan tradition, uh, it is used to it's, what I love about the Sukhavati is that it's, it's almost for all of us who remain behind. Because it's a way for us to um, hold that person who has died and let them go, and also to say that I'll be okay, and I'm sad, and I'm struggling, but I will find a way through this. Um, and a core practice within the Sukhavati, uh, you do read, uh, there's a chant that is read, but the, the primary practice is doing Tonglen practice. Uh, so you would sit for a period of time and then do uh, this practice called Tonglen. Are any of you familiar with Tonglen as a practice? Um, Tonglen is literally translated as sending and taking. And so the practice basically is that we initially take, we flash upon that Buddha nature, that awakened heart that is within us, that sane, brilliant, luminous light. And then we imagine the suffering of someone else. In this case, in terms of the Sakavati, we're imagining that maybe the friend, the loved one who's died, that maybe they're still struggling. Maybe they haven't quite found their way back. Maybe they're overwhelmed. And whatever fear and apprehension and anxiety that they're holding, I breathe that in. I breathe that in as dark, any, any of the dark, heavy qualities that that person might be struggling with, I breathe that in and as it touches my sort of open heart, my, that sort of luminous quality in myself, it's transformed into light. And I breathe that light back to that person. I take that dark, struggle heavy and I offer back from my own heart that it could be transformed so that they may have more ease, so that they may not have worry. And if I'm doing a Tonglen practice, I would do it for everyone in this room. I would think of each person and even though I don't know you, I would think about whatever that person is holding that maybe they're struggling with or something that might be weighing on them. I, I bring that to myself. I hold it, I witness it, I have it touch my Buddha nature, my open heart, and I offer back whatever I can that it may be released, that it may be shifted. I do that for my friends, I do that for people I don't know, and I do that for my enemies. And so in this ritual, we meditate, we do Tonglen, there's usually a, some talk of kind about death and about transition. Then there's an opportunity for that community to share, to tell stories about that person who has died. And then um, the, the, this uh, short liturgy, this short chant is read. And while that is being read, there's a point where the mantra uh, Namo Amitabhaya Hri is said and repeated. And while that is being repeated, the photo, a photograph and the person's name is lit on fire and it is burning. And Namaho, uh, Namo Amitabhaya Hri, as it's said over and over, we visualize that that person is, finds their way to the pure realm, that finds their way to, to ease, whatever that looks like. And we visualize that. And we also offer that, that we will be okay, that we are letting go that we grieve, that we are sad, but we don't want to hold them. We want them to move forward. And at the end, the ash from that photo and from that name is gathered and then is, go is usually offered out like to nature. And then we're back. <laughs> Thank you. In West Africa, in the Dagra tradition, uh, 
when someone sneezes right after you've said something, it means the ancestors are agreeing with what just was said. So, uh, thanks. Um, it's great for an argument, actually, like if someone sneezes, like, right, like where you're making a really good point and there's a sneeze, you go, you know, in West Africa, um, in his dog tradition, uh, that means that I'm right and they're agreeing with me. Um, it doesn't always work, but you have to be willing for it not to work in that argument. And so we may come back as human, we may come back as a bird, as an insect, who knows? But then this cycle begins again. When death comes, like a hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering, what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular. And each name a comfortable mouth, a music in the mouth, tending, as all music does, towards silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to this earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life I was a bride of amazement. I was a bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. Mary Oliver. Here's some resources um, that we can also send to people if they want. Um, and that's sort of the, the sort of end of the talk part. Um, but as always, there's now just an opening to have a discussion or a dialogue about some of these things. Thank you so much for being willing to.